So what I just gave you um, at the top it says solving polynomial equations in factored form. So factoring is what we've been spending this last week on. It's what your whole homework was on last night. I give you an expression, you're breaking it into its factors that multiply out to give you the problem. What we're not going to be doing is solving equations with this idea in mind. And the way we're going to do this is with something called the zero product property. And what the zero product property is based on is the idea that let's say I gave you this little problem here. I did two times six times zero. What is that going to equal? Zero, right? Because as long as one of our numbers in the product is a zero, isn't the whole thing a zero? So even if I make up another one, if I do a negative five, negative 10, or just 10, I throw a zero in the middle and then put a seven, do we agree that this whole thing is still going to equal zero? So as long as one number in our product is a zero, everything is a zero, all right? That is something we all know. That's not a big idea. So this whole left side is a zero. And because this guy's here, the whole left side is a zero. So we're using that idea to solve these equations. So what this says, if I give you A and B and I multiply those together, so if I have a number A and I have a number B, if I multiply those together and I get an answer of zero, wouldn't that mean that one of those, either A or B, has to have a value of zero? It's the only way I could get a number or product equal zero is if one of your numbers is A zero, okay? The solutions of a quadratic equation, quadratics are those, you remember the quadratic with the parabolas, the x squareds, all the stuff we've been working with are called, there's a couple things they're also called. So solutions are certainly one of them, but we will also call them zeros. That will be a big one. They also, when we do this graphically here over the next few days, end up being our x-intercepts. Okay. So if you look at number one, here's how the zero product property works with a function or a problem in quadratic form. So notice how I'm going to take this x and it is going to get multiplied by this x plus a three. All right, we're multiplying those together. Let me make this bigger here. All right, so let's say I want the left-hand side to be a zero. So one of the ways we can do this, kind of just think in our head, if I ask you what number could I pull, put into that parentheses, the yellow factor there, so that the yellow part becomes a zero, what x could I let x be to make the yellow become a zero? So what plus three would give me a zero? I'm already... Okay, so a negative three. Now, let's actually plug that in. If I, ha I have to do it for both, wouldn't I get a negative three out in front? And then I would do a negative three plus three. So even though I get a negative three for the blue factor, because it makes the quantity inside a zero, wouldn't that overall make our answer a zero? So x equals a negative three is one number that works that I could plug in for x and it does in fact equal the zero that it's supposed to. However, there's another one, all right? There is another x value that is going to work. That other x value is zero itself because if I now plug in a zero, again, for both of these factors, if I do the parentheses, I do zero plus three. So what am I gonna now get inside of my parentheses? A three. But if I plug in the zero on the outside, does it really matter what happens on the inside if I'm gonna ultimately be multiplying it by a zero? No. So if X is either zero, that's gonna make this factor a zero. If X is a negative three, that's gonna make that factor a zero. Those both make the left-hand side equal to zero that it's supposed to equal, okay? So those are our two different answers. If we go to number two, same idea. What, if I look at these here, as long as either one of these factors is a zero, it doesn't matter what other number I get in the other quantity. So if I ask you in this quantity right here, just kind of looking at this, being 15, 16 years old, being good solid math students here, what X value could I plug in to that yellow factor so that I get that to be a zero, Henry? Let's try it, Henry. So if I do zero plus seven and zero minus 10, does it make either factor a zero? No. All right, let's go with that one. So one of our answers is a negative seven. 
Because if I plug in a negative 7 for these x's, doesn't that first factor become a 0? And even though the second factor doesn't, because wouldn't the second factor be a negative 17, does it really matter what that second factor becomes if the first one is a 0? No. So the x value of a negative 7 is one of our answers because it makes the left-hand side a 0. However, there's another answer because if I do the blue one, what x value would make that quantity a 0? Amarian? A 10. So x equals 10 is our other answer. It doesn't matter that the yellow one would become a 17, right? If I plug in a, a 10 right here, doesn't this become a 17? But wouldn't this be a 0? And doesn't 17 times 0 give you a 0? So those are our two answers. Okay. Now, eventually, let me see what this next one is real quick. Yeah, go ahead and do three. See if we're understanding that idea. Just what makes each factor a zero. So do that part first. See if we're understanding that idea. All right, Sage. After all the cookie jokes, Sage, I'm glad to see you back. What will make this one a zero, Sage? Good. So one of our answers is one. All right. Do we all agree that that's what would make this first factor a zero? So that's one of our answers. All right. Riley, second one. What would make this factor into a zero? Eight. eight. So our two answers are one and eight. And then that's it. Now, eventually these get a little bit trickier to solve. You won't be able to just look at them. So here's how we can actually do this algebraically if you're not understanding how to do it in our head or eventually it becomes a little harder to do in our head. All we really need to do is to take that factor, the x minus 1, and set it equal to 0. You're basically asking it what would make it equal a 0. Same with the blue one. If I just took this second factor and set it equal to 0, don't we have two simple little equations that we all know how to solve? To solve this equation, I would add the 1 over. These would cancel. Notice that I get x equals a 1. Isn't that what we got by just kind of looking at and understanding what we're trying to do? If I do the same thing with the x minus 8, set that equal to 0, I would have added 8. Cancels here. And then 0 plus 8 is 8. Isn't that the second answer that we said we would get by just kind of looking at it and being able to do it in our head? Okay. So as they get a little trickier, and eventually they will. We could also just set these equal to the zero and solve those individual equations. Those are going to give us our two answers. So for number four, just humor me, we should be able to look at those like we have in the previous three or four and do those right in our head. But we'll do this kind of the long way just so we now know that's an option. I could just take those two factors, set them equal to zero, and solve them as a regular old little equation that we can all solve. So the first one, we would have added 4 to both sides, and we're going to get an answer of 4. Wouldn't that be what you would have gotten in your head for this one anyway? All right? So that's our 4. If I do the same thing with the 1 third, I'm going to add the 1 third over. This is going to cancel, and then our C is a 1 third. Same thing. You could have probably have done that one in your head. So moving forward. If these are really, really nice ones and you can do them in your head, totally fine. You don't have to set up multiple equations to do this. If you need to set up equations, also really nice. They're pretty simple. It's the safe way to do it. So now when I look at number five, to me, I would think most of you could do this one in your head. So tell me what that would be or just write it down what you think that answer would be. So basically what would make that first quantity a zero, whatever that answer is, is one of your answers. All right, so write that down. <clears throat> All right, Sarah, what is that number? Good. So we all agree 6 minus 6 would have made this a 0. So even though I plug in a 6 here, and I would have had, what, 12 minus a 4, so I would have gotten an 8. As long as this one is a 0, 0 times 8 is still going to equal a 0. Now, the second one, some of us can do it in our head. Some of us maybe can't. But it's a little bit more involved. So this one, we may want to rely on the idea that I could just set this equal to zero, that individual factor, and then just solve that equation. So if I now took that second one, set it equal to zero, 
just solve this. So that would require us to add the four over. So we now have two M set equal to a four. We would then divide by two and we are saying that the M value of two would make that a zero. We can test that real quick. If this M is a two, wouldn't two times two give you a four? And then if I subtract four, does that in fact make that second quantity a zero? Yeah, so those are our two answers. All right, six and four. All right, when we go to number six, kind of the same thing. Like I would hope this one, you could probably just do it in your head, but if not, you're gonna set up an equation and you're just gonna solve it. But that one, my guess is most of you could just look at it and state what that answer is gonna be. All right, anybody wanna give me that, that the highlighted one is, what X value would make that a zero, Hannah? Good, thank you, Hannah. So that's one of our answers. The other one, a little trickier. Some of us maybe could, some of us maybe can't. But this other one, I'm gonna definitely set up an equation. This one I would recommend most of us probably need to set this equation up. So now I'm gonna go ahead and say four X plus a one equals a zero. And then whatever that solves to be, that's gonna be our other answer but it's probably one we can't just look at, at least not right now, and state that answer. If we go through our steps, we would subtract the one over so that we get four X equals a negative one. Our final step is to divide by four. Those will cancel. I would just leave it. You can write it as a decimal if you like, but the fraction negative one fourth is our other answer. I'll show it. We'll prove it just to make sure that we would all agree. But if I now come up to this yellow factor here, if I do four, let the X be a negative one fourth and then add a one. Remember your good old um, cross canceling days. One of these fours cross cancel. And then I have a negative one plus one. Doesn't that give you a zero? All right. So that is the negative one fourth. Yeah. So when you always have these two answers, you won't always have two answers. So actually let's do that then, just so we can get that out of the way. So let's go to add like a six B in here. So do this for me. So let's say here's probably what will become the most common one. We do these tomorrow, but since we're on it right now, let's say I gave you that. You'll see a number of these tomorrow. Let's do the easiest one first. So this guy right here. So the one in the middle, if I gave you that set equal to zero, one of our answers would be, what makes this yellow one a zero? Amarian, two, all right? So that's one of our answers. If I do this one, this is probably also one that we can just look at and state our answer. We all agree that would then be negative two. But we also have another variable out here. Uh, come on, you, this guy, what makes that equal to a zero? Yeah, just zero, right? And again, you could just set that equal to zero, and then you're actually done solving that one. As soon as you set it equal to zero, that's one of your answers. So in this case, we actually have three answers, okay? Yeah, so good question. We'll, you'll see a number of those tomorrow. All right, so now, these are really, hopefully we're thinking, wow, this is, this is easy stuff. And if you're saying that, that's awesome. However, there's a little more to this. So if we go to the next one, if you notice in number seven, eight, nine, the next handful of questions, notice how this isn't factored. All of the ones at the top of the paper were already broken down with our rules from the past few days. We wanna get these factored. So for this first one, this is what we did for homework last night. This is a binomial. We now need to know all of those steps. So if I ask you first to identify if there's a greatest common factor. If we look at this, is there a greatest common factor between these two terms? Was it? Not quite. This one has a five, right? Does this have a, does this go have a five anywhere or 10 or 15 or 20? No. So in terms of numbers, there is no number, but doesn't this one have two B's and this one has one B. So they all have at least how many B's? One. So our greatest common factor is a B. So we're going to pull out a B and then you're going to multiply by whatever is left over. So we're going to have a B and then plus a five. And then we're gonna set that equal to zero. So that's what we did for homework last night, right? Bunch of factoring over and over and over again. Once we have done that, doesn't this now look like the six problems that we just, just did at the top of the paper? 
So we should now be able to answer our question pretty quickly. So this first one, if I did this one here, wouldn't one of our answers be the negative five? That's what would make that first factor a zero. And then I think it was the first time we did it last time. I'm already knew right away. What's going to make this one equal a zero? Just zero, right? So that answer, the blue one or yellow one, is just b equaling a zero. Those are our two answers. Okay. All right. So number eight, same idea. This is not in that nice factored form, so we want to put it into that form. So now, now we do have a common factor. Seven and seven. They each have a seven, so we're going to pull that out. Jump the gun a little. But if we look at the variables, this has two x's, this has one x. So they each do have at least one x that we want to pull out as well. Then we're going to multiply by whatever's left over. The 7 has been removed. I had two x's, I pulled one of them out. So there's only one x remaining. Same here, I pulled the seven out and I pulled the X out. What's left over for this term? Okay, there's nothing really there, right? Like we pulled everything out, but what do we have to put there to make sure that if we distribute, we still get this original term? A one, so you still have to put a one right there. So that if I redistribute seven X times X would be seven X squared and the seven X times the one would give us that seven X, okay? All right, one of these for sure you should know. So this answer right here should be an X value of one. So that's one of our answers. The other one, after you see this in the future, you could probably do this without much work. We're gonna take that seven X and we wanna know what would make that equal to zero. We'll go ahead and set up the equation for that one. Once that's set equal to zero, don't you then divide? And what does that still end up just giving you? Zero. So that second answer is zero. Okay. Okay, number nine. A little trickier. Uh, let's identify our GCF first. So what's the biggest number that would divide evenly into a 12 and a 30? Good. Six. Do they have a common variable also? Yeah, they each have at least how many ends? One. So we're also going to pull out an end, but then don't do this yet. Because this is what we talked about at the beginning yesterday. If that leading term is negative, we don't really want that. And it's because of what we're doing now. So what we said, if the first term is a negative, whatever your GCF is, we want to pull out the negative of that. So what we're actually going to put out in front is a negative 6n. Then we're going to multiply by whatever remains. So a negative 6 multiplied by what would give us a negative 12? 2. Positive 2. And then we had two ends. One of the ends got pulled out, so there's only one end remaining. Then a negative 6 multiplied by what would give us a positive 30? So negative 6 times what would give you a positive 30? Negative five. We had one in, I pulled it out, so there are no ends left over. That's our factored version. All right, I'm going to set up the equation for both of these. If you think you can do them in your head, maybe at least write them down or think it through, but I'm going to do equations for both. So I'm going to take this factor here, set that equal to zero. And then since this one is a little messier, I'm going to set that one equal to zero also. And then whatever those solve to be, those are your two answers. Both should be pretty nice. The first one I'm going to divide by the negative 6. And then 0 divided by 6 is 0. So hopefully what you're recognizing is as long as there's just a variable out in front and it's not being added or subtracted anything, it's still going to give you a 0 for the answer. Go through, solve this one. We would add 5 over. We then get 2n equals positive 5. Divide that by 2. And my second answer, we'll just leave it as a fraction, 5 divided by 2.
All right, those are our two answers. Okay. Yeah. The variable out this guy right here. Because what we're trying to pull out the GCF so that we can get each individual factor and figure out what the solution is to each individual one. We don't want them combined. We want them separated so we can identify what's the solution for each individual one. Okay. All right. So no help, no prompts. Do number 10. See if we're understanding number 10. See a lot of stump looks here. Remember, just follow the order. Is there a GCF? Is there a difference of squares? Those are the only two options if there's two terms. So first, you're going to look for that. If there is, you're going to pull it out, multiply by whatever remains. What do we think? Is there a greatest common factor? No. See a lot of people saying no. What am I in? Okay, yeah. So let's do the three. Let's do the numbers first. So between a three and a 14, is there a number that goes into both of those? No. Other than one or negative one. So in that case, no, there isn't. But if we go to the x's, doesn't this have two x's? Doesn't this one have one x? So don't they each have at least one x? So there is a GCF of X. That's what we want to pull out then. Then what's going to be left over, the three would still be there and only one of those initial two X's would remain. The 14 is still there. What's going on there? So the 14 is still there. And, but we took that one X out from that. So this is what this would look like in factored form. Now, this one, hopefully we're getting to the point, doesn't this just equal a zero? That's one of our solutions. This one, you may understand the little the little pattern now, but if you're not, that's definitely one that you, you may wanna set equal to zero and go through the steps. So take that, set it equal to zero. So subtract that 14 over. Divide by three. And then our second solution, if you did that right, got through all of this correctly, would have been a negative 14 thirds. <clears throat> okay. All right, 11 we're gonna skip for right now. Uh, jump to number 12. I wanna try to get through enough of these here. So go to number 12. Number 12 is the first one where now we add another layer, another little step here. So every single problem, if you look back at all 11 problems now before 12, notice how they were all set equal to zero. All right, every single one of them set equal to zero, set equal to zero. If you look at number 12, is it set equal to zero? No, so the whole idea of the zero product property is, we go back to the top of this paper is, we need to have our product set equal to a zero. And if we don't, we need to make it look like that. So when we go to number 12 now, if that's not set equal to zero, we need to make it set equal to zero. So the way we are going to do that for this problem, I want to get rid of this 8K. So I'm gonna do that by subtracting it. I ultimately kind of want to move it to the other side there. When I subtract that, do we all agree that that gives me a zero? 8K minus 8K is a zero. So we now have a zero on the right-hand side like we need, like we want, like every other problem has so far. But you learn seventh and eighth grade, whatever you do to one side, you got to do to the other. So I need to subtract 8K from the left-hand side as well. 
then what you also learned a long time ago, are these like terms, can I combine a K squared with a K? No, because they have to have the same degree as well. So even though they're both going to end up on the left-hand side, I want to write this as two separate terms, 4K squared minus 8K. Now, doesn't this look like the previous four or five problems that we did? Now we're ready to factor it, and you're ready to find the solution to each factor. So again, try this real quick, because the next type of problems are even different than these. Find your GCF. Multiply by what's left over. That should give you two factors. And then tell me the answers for those two factors. All right. All right, Juan, what was your GCF? Um, four, 4K. Four Good. They each are divisible by 4, and they each have at least 1K. So if I pull out a 4K, this 4 is gone. I'd only have 1K remaining for the first term. From the 8, I still have a 2, and that K has been pulled out. Okay? So now, Mirna, what... Oops, I don't want that. What would... What would what is I'm delayed here? All right, what would this solution be, Mirna? What makes that factor a zero? Two. So one of our answers would have been a two. And then the other factor, Mirna, uh, this one, what would make that factor a zero? Good. So our other factor is zero. Okay? Yeah. We don't care if it's in the equation. We don't want the first one to be negative. We want the four to be a positive. So since the four was positive, we don't want to pull out the negative. Okay. Okay, next page. Same idea. Notice how these are all set equal to zero, but now we're dealing with trinomials. So again, that's why we did that big practice yesterday so that we can now look at this, hopefully know how to factor this. So since this is not in that nice factored form, we want to put it into that factored form. So we'd look for a GCF first. There isn't one. But if we think about our little product sum idea, if I want numbers that multiply to be 12 and add up to be a 7, wouldn't that give us a positive 4 and a positive 3? Once it's in that nice factored form, we can look at this guy. And I would hope at this point most of us can do this in our head. Wouldn't this solution be a negative 4? And wouldn't this solution have to be the x value of a negative 3? And then those are our two answers. Okay. So 14. Notice how it's set equal to 0 already. So that guy is ready to be factored. So if we look at 14, if we look for the combination of numbers that multiplies to be a negative 15, but adds up to be 2, wouldn't that be x plus 5 and x minus a 3? A positive 5 and a negative 3 multiplied to be negative 15 and would add up to be a 2. All right. So then mark x plus 5. What would be the solution to that one? What makes that a 0? Good. A minus 5. And then Sage, what's going to make the second factor a 0? As in, good, positive 3. So x equals a 3. Okay? All right, 15. Do 15 real quick. See if we can come up with that. Anybody but got this combo? Multiply to be positive 24, add up to be a negative 10. Got it, Juan? What is it? Um, x neg, uh, negative 6 and x minus 4. Good. Negative 6, negative 4 give you a positive 24, 
when you add them, they give you a negative 10. All right. So Brandon, what X value would make that a zero? Good. Positive six. And then this one, Brandon? Good. Positive four. Those then are our two solutions. Okay. All right. 16 real quick. We'll do this one together. The numbers that multiply to be a negative 30 and add up to be a negative one would have been a negative six and a positive five. They multiply to be negative 30. Add them up. They're going to give us this little negative one right here. So then our answers would be positive six and negative five. Okay, last ones I want to make sure we get to, to do this now. Same as on the last page. Notice how this is now not set equal to zero. That is a problem. We need these to be set equal to zero. So I want to take this negative 24. I want to move it to the other side. So if I want to move it, how would I get rid of a negative 24? Add it. So we're going to do plus 24. That then gives you the zero on the right-hand side that we want. What we do to one side, you have to do to the other, however. So we're going to add 24 to the left-hand side. Notice how 24 is the only constant, though. So can we add that with anything else? No. And then we want to put it in the right order. So we want the squared term first. Then we want the 11x. And then we want the 24. Now it's nothing more than we did in, those first four, in the previous four problems. The numbers that multiply to be 24 and add up to be an 11, wouldn't that be an eight and a three? So X plus eight, X plus three, give you 24, add up to be 11. And then we hopefully can look at that and say that X is a negative eight for that first factor. X is a negative three for that second factor. All right, okay. found all that. Okay, you do have a little homework on this. This one I am gonna plus. All right, Diana, this one's flex for sure. This assignment is flex for sure. Dude. Yeah, it'll be up. You know what? Yeah, do one through 14. 15 and 16 we didn't quite get to. Uh, we'll do 15 and 16 before we get it in tomorrow. Okay. Do you not need this now? You won't need it now, right? No. Thank you. Oh, no, 
definitely a stop recording too.